In March 1898, a European company started building the Uganda Railway Bridge over the Tsava River in Kenya. The construction was supposed to connect Mombasa port to the hinterland Lake Victoria. It was an undertaking typical of expansionism by the British Empire, which in Africa occupied a large part of the territories in the south, west, and east as well. This does not take away the critics that were raised towards such a colossal project. In the homeland, it was seen by many as a waste of money and a probable failure, just a method to show strength among other colonizing countries. The building site consisted of several camps spread over an area of 13 kilometers, accommodating several thousand, mostly Indian workers. Lead was given to Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson, an engineer from England with Irish origins. The plans proceeded despite the problems, until authorized personnel suddenly started to disappear. Their corpses were found days later, torn to pieces. When Patterson learned of these episodes, he hypothesized that the victims had been killed by local bandits and criminals, interested in stealing the belongings of those they captured. Though this wasn't what his men reported. They had been hearing strange noises after the twilight, movements around the camps, guttural and distorted sounds. Then, absolute silence, followed by screams filling the air. The murderers began to be called demons, and they were two. Ghost and darkness. The locals were convinced that the spirits of ancient tribal chiefs, enraged by the actions carried out by the English, had taken the form of lions without manes to prevent the completion of the railway, slaughtering all those responsible. At first, Patterson proved skeptical about the possibility that the culprits of those deaths could be lions. No one had ever heard of these animals feeding on human flesh. It was thought that they generally preferred to eat carcasses, owned by other predators, and, if they were forced to hunt, they turned their attention to gazelles, buffaloes, and zebras. With this view of things, men simply did not fit into their diet. The colonel started to change his mind. When, night after night, workers were taken from their tents and dragged into the trees. Words trickled in about the massacre throughout the place, telling stories like the one of a respected man who was resting at the camp hospital while he was recovering from a sickness. One morning, his group saw him at the base of a gulmohor, a large white-flowered plant. The skin of his face was completely removed, as well as several muscles, depicting a crooked smile. The camp hospital was moved a mile away from its original position, but the scent which was left behind was strong enough to attract the lions the night later. There was an interval of several months when the incident ceased, though in nearby settlements, Analog situations were recorded. At some point, ghost and darkness returned, with almost daily killings following the same pattern. Under Harper's order, the workers tried to prevent dangerous encounters by keeping the campfire lit at night and making noise at regular intervals. They also built bomas, high reinforced fences made of whistling thorn trees, around their camp. They did not know that male African lions can jump easily over three meters from the terrain, well above that perimeter. A complicated psychological situation emerged. People at the site couldn't allow themselves to sleep adequately because of the lights and the hustle they needed in order to scare off their greater problems, with awareness that such extreme precautions probably wouldn't have been enough to save their life. It was noted that early in their massacre, only one lion at a time would enter the inhabited areas. With time, they became more brazen, entering together and each seizing a person. As the attacks mounted, hundreds fled from Tsavo, halting construction on what the locals were used to call the Iron Snake. At this point, colonial officials began to intervene. District Executive Mr. Whitehead narrowly survived an encounter with the duo after arriving at the Tsavo train depot in the evening. His assistant, Abdullah, was mauled while he escaped with four claw lacerations running down his back. Eventually, other support forces joined the hunt, with a reinforcement of around 20 armed sepoys. Patterson began spending his nights in the treetops with a loaded rifle and a goat tied nearby, hoping to attract the two predators. 
but each time they struck somewhere else. Exploiting the routine of the felines, the engineer conceived a cage disguised as a tent in which two volunteers, protected by a wall of wooden planks and armed with fire weapons, had to be the baits. After weeks, one of the man-eaters decided to enter the cage, which closed automatically when its paw touched the string that held the door open. The two workers were so terrified that they shot everywhere without ever scratching their target. The hits also succeeded in breaking down the door, allowing the animal to escape. Colonel Patterson, in desperation, wrote that he set out on the trail of the lions, going into the jungle and looking for their lair, but finding nothing. On December 9, 1898, one of the killers was sighted. He was feeding on a monkey, but he immediately fled, hearing the noise of people approaching. Since the monkey was still mostly intact, the general assumed that the lion would certainly return that night to finish its meal. Patterson, since there were no vegetation in the area, had a platform built on top of three poles crossed, and there he waited. As the sun went down, roars were getting closer. Dismayed, Patterson noticed that the lion remained in the bush and circled to the perch instead of approaching the monkey. Hours passed. When a shadow became more concrete before him, Patterson fired. A sound that resembled a thunder rumble immediately arose from the trees, and the colonel continued to fire blindly in the direction in which the foliage was shaken by sudden rustles. The following day, a lion without a mane and with fur, flayed by constant passage through the bushes, laid lifeless in that vicinity. Patterson wrote that he wounded it with one bullet from a high-caliber rifle. This shot struck its hind leg. The next one went through the shoulder, penetrating the heart thanks to the use of a more powerful rifle. The lion was three meters long, and it took eight people to carry the carcass to the camp. The lack of mane is actually typical of lions that area, perhaps an evolutionary adaptation due to very hot climate. The second lion was attracted by some goats and, wounded for the first time, disappeared for ten days. On December 29th, he returned at night to strike, but Patterson hurt him again, putting him to flight. He was followed and eventually tracked. Even when the animal was cornered and surrounded by the group of hunters, he continued to counter-attack after each rifle shot. It took seven bullets before he stopped moving. The first shot was fired from atop a scaffolding that Patterson had built near the goats. Two shots from a second rifle met the predator eleven days later as it was stalking Patterson and trying to flee. When they found the lion the next day, Patterson shot it three more times with the same rifle, two blows missed their target, and he shot it three times with a third rifle, twice in the chest, and once in the head. The carcass was as heavy and long as the other one. While exploring the jungle following the culls, Patterson found a cave containing numerous human bones and some metal ornaments, typical of indigenous people. This testimony, and most of those told so far, have been collected in the book Man Eaters of Savo and Other East African Adventures, edited by John Henry Patterson himself. The construction crew returned and finished the bridge in February 1899. Darkness and ghost, in conjunction with organizational issues, led to the Ugandan railway being mocked by many as the Lunatic Express. After 25 years as Patterson's floor rugs, the lion's skins were sold to the Field Museum of Natural History in 1924 for a sum of $5,000. The specimen arrived at the museum in very poor condition, but an equipe succeeded in getting them on permanent display, along with their skulls. At the end of the crisis, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Lord Salisbury, addressed the House of Lords on the subject of the Tsavo man-eaters. The whole of the works were put to a stop because a pair of man-eating lions appeared in the locality and conceived a most unfortunate taste for our workmen. At last the labourers entirely declined to carry on unless they were guarded by iron entrenchments. Of course, it is difficult to work a railway under these conditions and until we found an enthusiastic sportsman to get rid of these lions, our enterprise was seriously hindered. Despite these statements, it should be noted that long before the death of darkness and ghost, the lions of that area already demonstrated anthropophagous attitudes.
and they continued to do so for many years during the First World War. Cases were documented in which soldiers who were sent on patrol in the African steppe never returned, since they were devoured by local predators. The exact number of people killed during those years is unclear. Patterson gave several figures overall claiming that there were 135 fatalities. In 2001, a review about causes for man-eating behavior among lions revealed that the proposed toll was most likely an exaggeration, and that the more probable one was 2831. This reduced total was based on Colonel Patterson's original journal, courtesy of Alan Patterson, not a relative of John Henry Patterson. Here it was written that the subjects of this observation were Indian workers, and that casualties were much higher in the African worker population, though those numbers were not documented. Studies on the isotopic signature analysis in the bone collagen and hair keratin of Ghost and Darkness were published in 2009. Using realistic assumptions on the consumable tissue per person, energetic needs and assimilation efficiencies, researchers compared the man-eater's signatures to various reference standards. Savo lions with normal wildlife diets, grazers and browsers from Savo East and Savo West, the skeletal remains of Taita people from the early 20th century. Interpolation of their estimates across the nine months of recorded man-eating behavior suggested that one ate the equivalent of 10.5 humans and the other ate 24.2 humans. The scientific analysis does not differentiate between entire human corpses consumed compared to parts of individual prey. The attacks often raise alarm, forcing the lions to slink back into the surrounding area. This number can't take into account the ones who were killed but not eaten by the animals. The diet of the individual would also affect their isotopic signature. A low meat diet would produce a signature more typical of the herbivores, affecting the outcome of the test. Some of the workers at Savo were Hindus and may have been partly vegetarians. Furthermore, direct witnesses over the long construction period saw colleagues went missing, died in accidents, or left the site. It's not so strange to imagine that, when someone disappeared, demons were seen as the cause, while the person in question could have simply walked away from there. Theories for the man-eating behavior of lions have been reviewed by Peter Hans and Gnoske, as well as Dr. Bruce D. Patterson in 2004. Their hypotheses include the following. An outbreak of cattle plague in 1898 devastated the lion's usual prey, forcing them to find alternative food sources. The lions may have been accustomed to finding dead humans at the Tsavo River crossing. Slave caravans to the center of the East African slave trade, Zanzibar, routinely crossed the river there and maybe left those who were no more able to go on. A 2017 study carried out by the team of Dr. Bruce Patterson found that one of the lions had an infection at the root of his canine tooth, which made it hard for that particular lion to hunt. The other lion had a battered jaw, maybe a damage inflicted by Colonel Patterson when the lion charged him one night. Lions normally use their jaws to grab prey like zebras and wildebeests and suffocate them. Anyway. Studies indicate the lions ate humans as a supplement to other food, not as a last resort. Attacks are more frequent in groups that have not learned to be afraid of people, and in particular of firearms. Researchers have also verified that eating men is an acquired behavior for a lion that can be passed on to subsequent generations. An expedition organized by the Field Museum tried to track down the cave found by Colonel Patterson. Following the directions contained in his diary, nearly 100 years after the first attempt, four different teams of reconnaissance found a cave identical to the one photographed by Patterson. It was nearly two kilometers away from the Savo railway line. But the bones were no longer there, perhaps collected from a shipment organized by the University of Cambridge in 1920, or washed away by the rain and collapsed in an adjacent swamp. However, there is also another option. The Koaita families present in the area for centuries have been accustomed to burying their dead in sitting position. After a certain period, the skull is recovered and placed along with other schools, sheltered in one cave or other rock cavity. Excavations were then undertaken in the area to find any bones and determine its origin, but the lack of marks left on them by lions and the discovery of artifacts, Koaita would represent a confirmation of the sepulchral hypothesis. Errors like these ones are consistent with the ignorance of the local culture in those times.
the confusion that General Patterson felt when he did not understand how civilized workers could still end up eaten by a wild beast, however, was mainly due to the cultural substrate in which he grew up. Not long ago, it was almost taken for granted that, despite adversity, the species Homo dominated the ecosystem in which it lived, thanks to its intelligence and its urge to kill. It was called the Killer Ape Hypothesis. According to this vision of things, primitive humans would have slowly climbed the food chain, becoming the perfect predators, aggressive, violent, and almost pleasured by wounding other living beings. Only over time would they rise from their feral state to reach the supposed superiority of today's society. It was not known, and in the future it would not always be accepted, that our species has been, for a long time, an easy prey to the fauna that surrounded it more than a ravaging predator. Felines ate Homo sapiens, his cousins and his ancestors. And under the right conditions, sometimes caused by sapiens themselves, they can do it again. Thank you for the attention. If you appreciated the video, consider leaving a like, a comment and subscribing to this channel. Activate the bell if you don't want to miss future episodes of this podcast. If you want to know more about John Patterson and the situation he faced, you could go to the link in description and buy the book The Savo, Man Eater and Other West African Adventures on Amazon. Doing so, I take a small percentage from every purchase and I am able to auto-produce my contents. If you want to see more from this channel, on screen you will find my last video and something I think you may find interesting.